received his PhD uh, from Harvard uh, under the supervision of Noam Elkis. And then he moved to uh, a Microsoft research where he collected a large number of uh, these uh, small cubes, uh, implying he had some patterns and things like this. Uh, and uh, then he moved to uh, the University of Waterloo and uh, is uh, one of the pioneers of uh, isogeny uh, algorithms for cross quantum uh, systems. Please. Okay, thanks, Francois. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, quantum algorithms for isogenies. Um, nothing that I will say today is new in the sense of uh, research. Um, I'm just trying to bring together um, sort of existing known facts so that we can um, have them all in one place and make more progress on um, quantum algorithms for isogenies and related computational topics. Um, and I think there is a lot of, um, you know, ground that, um, you know, could be explored here. Uh, the, the current state of the art for quantum algorithms is, um, you know, not great as far as it goes uh, for isogenies. I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so, well, elliptic curves, um, what are they? Um, probably most people here know, but uh, just to, you know, fix our notation, I guess. So, um, my notation is going to be that E is the curve, F is the field um, over which E is defined. Um, uh, we, we have short Weierstrass equations for these curves. Um, I'm using only fields of characteristic, not two or three, so that we do indeed have uh, short Weierstrass equations. Um, I'm going to be using the infinity symbol to denote the, um, the point at infinity, the identity element uh, of the elliptic curve. Uh, some people use a cursive O, but I'll use, I'll use infinity here. So most cryptographers know that we have a group law on elliptic curves. You take two points, you can add them up. Uh, it goes roughly like this. You reflect around this way. That gives you a point here. Uh, this is the group law. This is used in um, sort of standard elliptic curve cryptography. Um, but that's not what we're talking about today. We want to talk about quantum stuff and specifically post-quantum stuff. And um, the way to get post-quantum cryptography out of elliptic curves is to use isogenies, which are maps between elliptic curves. And these are a little bit more complicated than the group law. There's sort of more, um, you know, diversity um, in isogenies. There's lots and lots of, um, you know, is isogenies between elliptic curves. So what these are, are um, they're maps between elliptic curves. So they're the uh, sort of morphisms in the category of elliptic curves. They're the, when you think of a map from one elliptic curve to another, an isogeny is the right thing. Um, so what these are, um, are well, if you think about what an elliptic curve is, an elliptic curve is an algebraic variety and it's a group, right? It has a group law, but it also has this algebraic variety structure. And so certainly a map in some sense between these objects would have to be a map in the sense of algebraic varieties and it would also have to be a map in the sense of groups. And it turns out that um, imposing both of those conditions together uh, gives you the right thing. So an isogeny is going to be a morphism of um, elliptic curves, by which I mean it is a morphism in the sense of algebraic varieties, and it is a um, homomorphism in the sense of groups. Um, there is some, um, I guess, uh, you know, non-standardization as far as whether or not a constant morphism counts uh, as an isogeny. I'll use the convention here that um, an isogeny has to be a non-constant morphism. Of course, the only possible constant morphism that is a group homomorphism would be the constant map that sends everything uh, to the identity. So that's the only thing you're losing out on here. Uh, it's just a matter of notation, whether you want to call that an isogeny or not. Um, so all of the, these isogenies being morphisms of varieties, they, they're rational maps, right? So they look like uh, quotients of polynomials and this is a little bit uh, sort of excessively uh, complicated. You don't actually need like, you know, two variables over here, for example, and things like that. Uh, you can simplify this a little bit, uh, but I don't think I really need to get into that, all of that. Um, I do need to uh, mention the concept of the degree of an isogeny, and this just means its degree is an algebraic map. So, um, you know, you have polynomials have degrees, rational functions have degrees, and so then isogenies um, also have degrees. Um, one uh, thing that you can sort of take away um, from the sort of construction of the definition of isogenies is that um, 
an isogeny it's a group homomorphism so it has a kernel and it's a non-constant rational map and so um, that kernel being the inverse image of the identity, it has to be a finite set, right? When you think about polynomials, right? A non-constant polynomial um, has a finite set of roots. Uh, it's the same thing here, right? Uh, you think of the points in the kernel as the roots, the, the values that map to uh, the identity element. Uh, it has to be a finite set. Um, and so that finite set is what we're going to call the kernel of the isogeny. Um, and what's interesting here is that um, you can sort of go backwards, right? I, I, mean, I guess that's not, not super surprising if you think about these as, um, you know, rational maps, right? Like for polynomials, if I give you a set of roots and I tell you to construct a polynomial having exactly that set as its set of roots, um, you can more or less do it, right? I mean, there's some ambiguity in terms of the, you know, whether the polynomial is monic or not, but roughly speaking, there's only one, um, you know, polynomial having a given set of roots. And, Similarly for groups, right? If I give you a um, you know, group homomorphism and I say, here's the kernel of the group homomorphism, then uh, roughly speaking, there's only one such um, group homomorphism, um, you know, as long as it's like surjective and, and things like that, okay? So it's the same thing for isogenies. Uh, if I give you a finite set and I designate that set to be the kernel, then roughly speaking, again, with some exceptions, there's only one um, isogeny uh, up to isomorphism of that having that um, you know, set as its kernel, right? And so there's a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence in a certain sense between um, you know, isogenies up to isomorphism and these finite sets, which um, constitute uh, their kernels. And in fact, there are formulas for um, you know, finding uh, the isogeny associated to a given finite kernel. Uh, there's the formulas from, uh, by Velu in 1971 uh, right here that give you, uh, you know, a formula for the rational maps like these are the rational maps uh, defining the uh, isogeny having kernel k right notice that this sum over here um, has like this many terms right and oh by the way the this many this this the cardinality of k this is also the um, degree of the isogeny right the number of roots of a polynomial is the degree of the polynomial the number of um, items in a kernel is the degree of the isogeny so in order to implement this uh, formula, you need to perform a sum over a number of terms equal to the degree of the isogeny. Um, this is quite easy when the degree is small. When the degree gets very large, uh, then, you know, like cryptographically large, for example, then you wouldn't be able to do this directly. Um, and so that's why, it's, um, that's why isogenies are hard, I guess. You have, to, you have to work around this problem if you want to use isogenies for cryptography. Okay, um, there are like some slightly faster uh, ways to do this uh, in, in 2020 um, Bernstein and others uh, came up with this um, value. Uh, oh, I think I got the notation backwards is that you have to like put the square root in the V or something like that. It's like value square root or square root value. Um, you can do it in square root time using um, resultant calculations instead of um, directly uh, summing it up. But I, for our purposes, it doesn't, um, really matter. Um, you know, we're only talking about uh, things that are mostly exponential time anyway. Uh, so saving that uh, sort of doesn't make a qualitative difference in the asymptotics. Um, yeah, so those are, um, you know, uh, the general, um, you know, definitions of isogenies. There are some special cases of isogenies that, um, you know, will play an important role in the theory that we're going to talk about. Um, one of those important special cases is the case of an endomorphism. So an endomorphism is simply an isogeny from a curve to itself, right? So when you have um, a, a map from this curve going back to the same curve, um, those kinds of isogenies are special, um, not least of all uh, because you can compose them, right? Like so if you have alpha and you have beta and the sort of domains and the ranges are the same, then you can compose them. And that gives you a concept of multiplication and that actually then gives you um, a ring, right? Because you need multiplication in order to get a ring. Uh, so if you take that structure, um, you know, all the endomorphisms of E uh, under this multiplication operation, you get a ring. Um, well, you need to add the constant homomorphism, which as I just explained a few minutes ago, we are not technically considering to be an isogeny. So, uh, but we need to add it here uh, in order to get a zero element for this ring, okay? Um, now, over a finite field, um, there are two possible um, sort of types of endomorphism rings that you could get. Um, there's the ordinary um, 
type of endomorphism ring. Um, so these ordinary rings, endomorphism rings, are endomorphism rings which are a subset of a quadratic order, right? So this um, Q joins square root of D over here, and specifically an imaginary quadratic order. So D has to be negative uh, in this case. So if your endomorphism ring is a subset of one of these, um, you know, quadratic fields, uh, then you say that the elliptic curve is ordinary. Um, the other possible case over a finite field is that your endomorphism ring could be um, a, a subset of a quaternion algebra. So this is a quaternion algebra, and this is ramified at p and in infinity. Um, p is the characteristic of the finite field. I guess I didn't make that clear, so I'll write that over here. Okay. Um, so if you if you have an elliptic uh, curve whose endomorphism ring is one of these things, um, which is larger than a quadratic field, it's four dimensional instead of two dimensional. Then we say that the elliptic curve is super singular. Okay. Um, isogenies look like um, rational maps. Um, they they actually look like rational maps with particular um, you know there's there's a lot of structure to them. They're not like random rational maps, right? So for example, here we see that. Um, the x coordinate of an isogeny is um, purely a function of the x coordinate of the, um, you know, uh, of the uh, original curve, uh, and the y coordinate of the isogeny is y times a function of the x coordinate, um, and that's that's well, that's if you use uh, you know short Weierstrass form. If you use other forms, then um, like Edwards form or whatever, you're going to get different uh, types of formulas for these things. Um, notice that this, so this is an example of a degree two isogeny, right? It is degree two, um, like if you, I, I wrote it out this way, but if you, this is what you get from Velu's formula. But if you combine these two, um, you know, sum ends into one expression, then you would get a rational function of degree two, right? Um, and similarly for degree three, um, if you run it straight through Velu's formula, uh, you get this um, output here, and then you have to look at stared a little bit to see that, yes, it, indeed, these um, rational functions are degree three. Um, you can get more complicated, um, you know, expressions using Velu's formula, right? So here I have um, ready to go a degree um, 72 um, isogeny. And um, if I want to show you the rational maps, I can do that. It's kind of complicated, but there you go, right? Um, the, 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 the structure of these uh, sort of isogenies is going to get uh, increasingly more complicated uh, as, the, as the degree goes up, uh, just because, um, you know, that's, that's kind of how isogenies behave. All right, so now I'll um, start with, um, you know, some of the crypto systems that we're going to talk about. Uh, the first one that I'm going to talk about is uh, called SIDH, stands for Super Singular Isogeny Diffie-Hellman. Um, it's the crypto system that uh, Luca DeFeo and I, um, you know, devised in 2011. Uh, it's not actually the first isogeny-based crypto system. The first one is um, the first one is uh, a earlier one uh, that we nowadays call CRS. I'll explain that on the next slide, but I'm going to talk about mine first because I can, I guess. All right, all right. So SIDH, how does this work? Um, so in, in SIDH, we use um, su we use super singular elliptic curves, right? So we're going to start with a single super singular elliptic curve. Um, and from the general theory of elliptic curves, we know that these can be defined over FP squared. And so we're going to go ahead and do exactly that. Right? Um, now, not every P is going to work. Uh, you need a particular prime of a particular form here. Uh, it needs to be um, a prime of, I think, this form. Um, although I, we usually use minus one um, because it's easier. Uh, so you need a prime of that form, uh, not too hard to find those things. Um, the way that it works is that um, you have, it's a key exchange, um, right? So you have two parties, Alice and Bob, um, they're going to choose a secret and then publish a sort of public value based on that secret. And the secret is going to be the kernel of an isogeny, right? And the public value <clears throat> is going to be, um, roughly speaking, the codomain of that kernel or the, the sort of image, okay? And so the notation I use here, I guess I didn't uh, sort of describe this uh, fully when I was talking about, um, oops, my computer crashed. Sorry about that. Let's try again. All right, so I didn't fully mention this, but my notation is gonna be that, so if I have a kernel, uh, so if K is the kernel here, um, 
then my notation is going to be that E mod K is the codomain and phi sub K is the isogeny um, attached to that particular kernel. Okay. And so using that notation, uh, if we go over um, into the SIDH slide, um, so I have a kernel here, uh, which is A. And so there's my kernel. And then my codomain is going to be uh, E mod A. All right. So I'll just use that. It comes from, it's like reminiscent of group theory where uh, you mod out um, by a kernel to get a uh, codomain of a homomorphism. And I'm also, so Alice needs to send as her public data, the codomain of the associated isogeny, and also some partial information about the associated isogeny, which in this case is um, the isogeny, but restricted to um, some subgroup of the domain. And the particular subgroup that we're gonna use is the subgroup of three to the F torsion points, right? And what's the significance of three to the F? Well, the significance is that three to the F uh, sort of is the order of Bob's kernel. So Bob's kernel sort of lives inside um, the three to the F torsion points and Alice's kernel lives inside the two to the E uh, torsion points here where two to the E and three to the F come from over here, um, the, um, you know, the definition of P, right? And so each party is going to pick a kernel inside a particular part of the domain and then they're going to send the codomain of their isogeny with that kernel. And they're going to send the information of their isogeny, um, the values of their isogeny, but restricted onto the other person's uh, sort of space, kernel space, so to speak. All right. And the reason you need to do that is because uh, in order for, uh, in order to do key exchange, you need a shared secret, right? And that, sh that shared secret is going to be um, the original elliptic curve modulo both of those kernels. And you can calculate this by taking one of the codomains and taking sort of um, the other person's um, isogeny evaluated on your kernel, right? But in order to be able to do that, um, you need to transmit, um, you know, your secret isogeny on the values of your secret isogeny on, your, on the other person's like space of possible kernels so that they can evaluate uh, in phi A of B or phi B of A, right? Because remember, you're not transmitting A and you're not transmitting B, you're not transmitting the kernels, right? And you're not transmitting the maps themselves, that would be tantamount to transmitting the kernels, uh, but instead you're going to transmit this sort of very restricted amount of information, this restricted image um, of your isogeny, okay? And so then that gives you um, a key exchange, which if you squint um, sort of not too carefully, it looks roughly like uh, Diffie-Hellman, hence the name uh, super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman, right? So that's the first scheme. Um, the other um, sort of family of isogeny-based public key Kirkle systems uh, is this earlier scheme by uh, Kovanes, Rostov, Stev, and Stolyanov. So um, this particular scheme doesn't um, sort of directly uh, rely on, you know, shared secrets that are obtained by quotient out by, uh, you, know, two, um, you know, two kernels. But instead here, what we're going to do is we're going to um, use kernels that are derived from uh, what we call complex multiplication, right? So the complex multiplication action here. Um, and um, what this means is, um, so you have an elliptic curve. It's ordinary in this case. And so that means that the endomorphism ring of E is, it's like some quadratic order, uh, which is a subset of this uh, sort of imaginary uh, quadratic number field. So something that looks like this. And this quadratic order, um, you know, from number theory, we know that it, it has a sort of interesting ideal class group, right? Um, and so that ideal class group um, actually gives you a, it gives you a certain, it gives you like a group action um, on elliptic curves after isomorphism. And the action is defined exactly by this formula right here that I uh, sort of just circled over here, right? So ideal star curve um, is defined, it's defined in terms of an isogeny, right? So it's E modulo this kernel right here, right? It's the kernel of points that are annihilated by everything in the ideal, right? Um, now I say ideal, um, but actually um, if you take a different ideal in the same ideal class, you get the same curve up to isomorphism. You get the same isogeny up to isomorphism. And so it doesn't matter uh, sort of which representative of the ideal class you take. And so, uh, but you need to you need to phrase it, I guess, in terms of ideal classes in order to go get a group action because if you just phrase in terms of ideals, those don't form a group, right? Um, so you get a group action here 
And this group action lets you perform something that looks even more like Diffie-Hellman, right? Um, because there is a group involved, at least. It's an abelian group because ideal class groups are abelian. Um, and so that gives you a um, way of um, sort of performing uh, a Diffie-Hellman like key exchange, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to choose a secret group element in the ideal class group, and then you're going to send uh, you know, these two things over here, Alice will send A star E, Bob will send B star E, and then each person can compute A star B, A, A star B star E, right? So that gives you the shared secret. Um, there's a later scheme called Seaside, Seaside by um, Water Castric and four other authors uh, that uses the same group action, uh, but over a super singular elliptic curve. So in the super singular case, you know, the, the endomorphism ring is not, um, equal to an imaginary quadratic order, um, but you can like just kind of pretend that it is because you could you could take an imaginary quadratic order, um, you know, inside, uh, you know, as a very small um, subset of the uh, larger quaternion algebra ramified at P and infinity. And so then you could still view it, um, you know, as the same kind of situation. And then you can do this, right? So that's CRS. Um, We'll start with Conrad attacks uh, against side, uh, against SIDH, right? So what do these look like? Um, the fastest known um, quantum attack um, at this point um, isn't, I mean, it isn't really what I would call a quantum attack. Uh, it's just, you're, you're gonna do, um, you know, brute force collision search, and you may be able to speed up uh, sort of the brute force method using quantum um, algorithms, just like you can speed up anything, like, you know, inverting a one-way function or something uh, using quantum algorithms. But it's not, it's not like there's, there's nothing, um, you know, specifically quantum um, about it, right? But because it's the best we have, um, sort of let's describe how it's done, right? So what you're looking for is you want an isogeny of degree, uh, this degree is two to the E, let's say, or three to the F, but let's just say two to the E for simplicity. Right. So you have an isogeny of some degree uh, that looks like that, and you want to find that isogeny. All right. And so what you're going to do is you can start by, well, naively, what you can do is you can find like all the isogenies of degree two to the E. Right. And you can't do this directly. Um, the reason why we need, and by the way, the reason why we need to use these like special degrees, like two to the E, is because if you go back to the loose formula, and hope my thing doesn't crash over here, um, you see, you can't compute an isogeny of a large degree directly um, using Bailey's formula. It's just going to take too long. And so by using isogenies of these special degrees, two to the e or three to the f, um, you can construct this isogeny by taking a sort of long composition um, of isogenies of degree two, right? Specifically e of them, exactly e of them. If you compose them together, you get an isogeny of degree two to the e. And that's something that you can compute because isogenies of degree two uh, are easy to compute using uh, the loose formula. But here we're not trying to compute such an isogeny, we're trying to find such an isogeny. And so that's a that's a very different problem, right? So here you have this like needle and haystack problem. There's many, many isogenies uh, of degree two to the E starting from E. Of course, not all of them will end up, you know, with codomain equal to E mod A. But if you don't know the kernel to begin with, um, then you're stuck with sort of doing a brute force search to try to find this. Um, you could start from E and go all the way, you know, up over to E mod A. Um, that would take, um, you know, approximately like, you know, two to the E uh, steps to do something like that, um, to, you know, try all the possible isogenies of degree two to the E until you found the one that had the correct um, codomain. Um, you can do a little better if you already know the code ring, which you do here, um, by sort of going halfway, right? So imagine that we just go halfway um, from the left side and then from the right side, right? So starting from the left, we write out all possible isogenies of degree um, in the left side, it would be two to the E over two, right? And then on the right side also, uh, two to the E over two, right? So if you do it that way, then you only need two to the E over two steps. Um, that makes it, um, quite a bit uh, easier. It's still exponential time, uh, but uh, it's not uh, quite as bad. Okay. Um, and that is more or less the, um, you know, fastest known, um, you know, way to find 
uh, you know, an SIDH private key, let's say, uh, from the public information, as far as we know to date. Um, you know, there may be somebody may find a breakthrough later on, but um, you know, as things stand right now, that's the that's the fastest algorithm known. Um, you can do a little bit better uh, if you um, you know assume quantum computation capabilities. Um, there's 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 an algorithm uh, called Tani's algorithm, which um, on paper at least um, is like e an exponent of like e over three instead of um, e over two, right? But um, you know whether or not uh, the that benefit can actually be realized, um, you know, depends on, depends a lot actually on uh, sort of what quantum computers look like. Um, and we don't really know uh, right now what quantum computers look like. Um, now some, some people have um, analyzed the security um, of SIDH under various, um, you know, assumptions about, you know, what quantum computers are going to look like um, in the, in the future. Um, and some of these, um, you know, are, listed here there's a series of papers by various authors um, where uh, where people go through uh, these things uh, so for example um, you might you might wonder you know why are there two lines for Tani's algorithm here uh, it's because um, in the first case over here you're sort of uh, assuming that um, you know storage is um, you know I want to say like free to maintain or something in a certain sense Right, so imagining that there's no like active effort required to um, refresh, um, you know, quantumly accessible memory uh, every time you want to use it. Uh, whereas in the second line over here, um, you're sort of assuming that there's some sort of refresh cost, uh, thing like DRAM or something like that, um, to memory where you have to, you know, constantly do something uh, to to maintain uh, the, the 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 memory as it is. Right, so depending on like assumptions like this, um, you it, it might even be plausible that um, quantum computers offer no advantage at all um, in attacking uh, SIDH. That you know, just throwing a bunch of classical hardware uh, at the problem is the is the best way to do it. Um, a, a lot of this depends on you know what quantum hardware is going to look like. So that these questions will be answered uh, eventually when somebody builds a quantum computer and we look. We look at what it does, uh, but for now we we have to speculate. Okay, all right. So that's like those. Are, so those are the best, um, you know, currently known uh, attacks. The fastest currently known attacks. Um, but I want to mention also that um, you know there are some efforts to um, find other avenues of attack um, that uh, could possibly uh, become. Um, better in the future. Um, right now, they're not quite there yet, um, but that's that's the nature of research, right? Uh, you know, you you sometimes um, need to spend um, some effort uh, working on an initially uh, less optimal uh, method uh, in order to make it better so that it becomes more optimal um, in the future. And so, I think that's uh, where things stand right now with a class of attacks that are called torsion point attacks. Um, now, again, so far, these, these attacks here um, are, I want to say, mostly classical, right? So even though, um, you know, this talk is ostensibly about quantum stuff, um, most of this um, work is of a classical nature. We're just trying to find, you know, faster classical algorithms for um, breaking um, isogenies or SIDH in particular. Um, and we're not there yet, um, but there's been some work uh, in this direction. So uh, I have here, uh, you know, a couple of papers. Uh, the first one by Petit is the one that sort of started this whole thing. Um, and then this, the second one in uh, crypto from last year uh, is the more or less the, the latest status, although this uh, area uh, is seeing rapid progress. So um, maybe, maybe we will um, already have something better by now. Um, so the way that these torsion point attacks work is, um, you know, let's pretend that we want to find an isogeny uh, for an SIDH key, right? So an SIDH key consists of the codomain and the sort of torsion point image, the sort of restricted image that you have to convey um, in order to um, 
you know, do the heat exchange, right? And the interesting thing about torsion point attacks is that they actually use this extra data, this torsion image. And actually, this, actually, this is actually used um, in these torsion point attacks. Whereas for the brute force um, approaches, the torsion images were just are just not used at all, right? So in this case, we want to find the isogeny. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, consider um, endomorphisms in the codomain of a specific form, right? So the form is that, um, so we have this E, we have E mod A, we have an isogeny phi. Now imagine that um, we have an endomorphism of E, which we call theta, and then we have a sort of backwards going map phi hat, which is the dual isogeny to phi, so it goes backwards, right? And then um, what you're going to consider is you're going to consider, I guess I drew this wrong, but you're going to consider like this map, right? So going from through phi hat, through theta, and then through phi, okay? Um, so those kinds of maps uh, are then endomorphisms of E mod A, right? Um, now, uh, if you um, sort of know the endomorphism ring of E, then you can find you know, appropriate thetas uh, without too much difficulty. That's what it means to know uh, the endomorphism ring. And then if you uh, sort of set it up and you solve a certain Diophantine equation, which is not entirely uh, trivial to solve. It is in some cases, but uh, for SIDH, it's not entirely trivial to solve. Uh, but so if you solve a certain um, Diophantine equation, all right, then um, you can find, um, you know, suitable endomorphisms theta and D. You also need an integer D here that you need to add uh, into this um, endomorphism. You can find, uh, you know, integers D and endomorphisms theta uh, such that the degree of tau has a special form. So then the degree of this uh, overall isogeny here uh, would have degree three the f times n uh, for some um, n, all right? And then what you want to do now, once you get this tau, is you want to like sort of isolate the two parts, right? So there's, uh, if the degree is a product of these two integers, then that means that the isogeny itself actually factors into a composition where of, you know, there's an isogeny of degree three to the f, and then there's an isogeny of degree n. And you want to find each of those isogenies, all right? Now, finding the isogeny of degree three to the f is not that hard, because um, you know everything about what happens to three to the f torsion, uh, right? And you're given, you're given um, the image of phi on three torsion, so you're, you know that. You know theta, because you chose it. Uh, you know phi, uh, and you know d, right? So you know everything here. So you can compute um, the three to the f part of tau very easily. Um, the other part, the part of degree n, is a little harder to compute. You have to use brute force for that, right? Um, and then once you get tau, you can get phi, right? Uh, this is all explained in um, these papers. I'm not going to go through that in detail, right? So you do all this work, um, then you can get um, the isogeny. This is all classical, right? There's, these are all classical algorithms. But you can, uh, as, as before, you can use quantum uh, sort of algorithms to speed them up here. And I wasn't expecting a blank slide here. This is another uh, sort of technical problem. Give me one second, please. Um, is this a blank slide? There we go. Okay. okay. So um, you can use quantum algorithms to um, speed things up, right? Like everything there was classical, but um, you know you can use like Grover search or whatever. Um, to find the isogeny of you know, degree n a little bit faster or to solve the Diophantine equation uh, a little bit faster, things like that. So if you do all that, then what you're going to find is that um, you get a speed up for like most possible um, parameter sets. Um, excuse me here. Sorry about that. So if you, um, if you, um, you know, if you use quantum algorithms to speed up uh, the torsion point attacks, then um, what you're going to find is that for most uh, sort of choices of parameters, so here, the, the, the way to read this chart is that alpha is roughly speaking, like the size of two to the e. And beta here is roughly speaking the size of like three to the f. Okay, um, and for most um, you know possible um, you know scenarios, you actually do get a speed up compared to um, regular um, you know brute force 
of the isogeny, right? Um, so um, here, the, the, the meaning of this chart, and this is taken directly from uh, this crypto um, paper that I've cited here. Uh, I literally copied the figure. Um, but the, 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 the meaning of these uh, sort of uh, colors is that um, in the orange region, we get a polynomial time algorithm. Um, in the uh, sort of uh, intermediate orange, I guess, you get a classical speed up. And here you get a quantum uh, speed up, right? So you'll notice that psych sort of sits uh, right at the threshold of a quantum speed up, um, that the torsion point attacks, um, you know, as they currently stand, don't, um, you know, improve the state of the art in terms of quantum, um, you know, cryptanalysis of SIDH, um, but they're really close, right? They're as close as you can get without actually um, you know, improving upon naive brute force. Um, and it really is as close as you can get, right? Because, um, you know, this whole diagram is symmetric, right? Like if, um, you know, if, if you happen to have parameters here, right, for example, then you could just like interchange the roles of alpha and beta. There's nothing saying that, you know, alpha has to be the one and beta has the other. You can just like pretend it's the other way around. And then, you know, you would flip along the diagonal, right? So the important thing to look at here is this diagonal um, sort of right here. And you see that, um, you know, based on, and, and psych has to lie somewhere on this dashed line over here, right? Like, um, you know, you have to, you have to choose some, um, you know, distribution, um, you know, of your isogeny degrees um, lying somewhere along that dashed line. And so, you know, I mean, the middle is a natural place to put it, uh, but the middle is also the only place where you don't get a uh, quantum speed up, right? Um, so, uh, oh, and this, the second dashed line refers to like, uh, you know, B side, um, you know, or any other, any other scheme that, uh, kind of looks like psych, uh, SIDH, but, um, you know, uses sort of twin primes instead of, uh, you know, just, just one single prime. And so the, the security of B side is affected at least, um, you know, in, in quantum terms, um, by the torsion point attacks, but psych so far, uh, is, is just barely not affected. Okay. And that's it, right? So that's that's where uh, things stand right now as far as quantum um, attacks on SIDH. All right, so now I'm gonna talk, I guess a little bit um, about quantum attacks for uh, the other kind of isogeny-based uh, crypto systems. So these are uh, CRS and CSIDE, right? Um, in this case, the hard problem is basically to compute group action inverses. Right, so you're you're trying to like invert a group action, um, given given two uh, elements of a set being acted upon by a group, uh, find a group element that takes you know the one into the other. Um, now this is a little bit um, less general than you know inverting an arbitrary group action. There are some things that you can uh, take advantage of here. Uh, perhaps the biggest is that um, in this case the action is like it's free and transitive. Um, in fact, you have, um, you know, the, the size of the group is the same as the size of the set. And uh, every, um, you know, combination of two elements um, in the set, x0 and x1 in this case, has exactly one group element that um, takes one to the other, right? Um, so it's like a uh, sort of bijective uh, sort of version of a group action. Um, in this case, uh, when, you have, when you have this kind of scenario, um, there, there is a uh, meth there's a quantum algorithm that um, you know speeds up this uh, attack a little bit faster than a naive brute force. And this algorithm is due to uh, Kuberberg, uh, who I think spoke uh, earlier in this workshop. Uh, I don't know if he's here right now, but um, it's, um, it, it's something that uh, sorry, he came up with in 2003, 2005, long before uh, isogeny cryptography was uh, publicly. Uh, known to have been proposed, um, by the way. So it's just sort of sitting in there, sitting there waiting uh, for the right moment to be used. Um, but in this case, what you want to do is you want to think of uh, this group action uh, sort of not necessarily as, you know, a group action, uh, you know, on its own, but what you can do is you can, you can take this group action problem and you can rephrase it uh, in terms of a hidden subgroup problem, right? Um, the way you do that is um, you consider um, a dihedral group, um, and the, the, the meaning here of dihedral is that 
uh, it has a large um, abelian subgroup, lar as large as possible without being abelian. So you have a subgroup here. Uh, if I call this group like D, let's say, right, then G is a subset of D and the index um, is two, okay? And so you have a uh, sort of large abelian subgroup of index two, which is as large as it can be without the whole group um, being abelian, right? But um, it is, it's called dihedral because it, it sort of is reminiscent of, um, you know, the normal dihedral group where you have like some sort of polygon, right? And you're taking, um, you know, symmetries of the polygon. And those symmetries include rotations, which are abelian, but then also these reflections, which are non-abelian. But um, there's only sort of one way to reflect a polygon. And so the uh, rotations form an index two subgroup of the dihedral group. And so the same kind of thing works here. Uh, formally, you take a semi-direct product of G together with, um, you know, integers mod two, um, and that gives you the dihedral group. And then it turns out here that um, to compute an inverse of a group action uh, is the same thing as to find um, a subgroup, a hidden subgroup inside a dihedral group. And here your hidden subgroup is, is going to have uh, order two. So it's going to be some sort of you know, reflection, uh, you know, of angle gamma or something like that um, around the, uh, you know, around some some axis, uh, if, you, if you're thinking of it as a classical dihedral group, uh, which it is if G is cyclic, right? But uh, it's going to be a reflection around, uh, you know, of this polygon uh, by some angle gamma. And that um, gamma corresponds, uh, that, that gamma is also a, it's like a group element, right? Because uh, it has, you know, an angle is an angle of rotation. And so if you view that angle as a group element, then uh, gamma comma one um, is, if it was gamma comma zero, it would be rotation. Gamma comma one is a reflection um, around an axis uh, of angle gamma, but then that gamma solves the um, group action inverse problem that you're trying to solve, right? So by looking for uh, this particular uh, hidden subgroup of order two, um, you can solve the uh, group action inverse problem. And so then, um, you know, Cooperberg came up with uh, a quantum algorithm uh, to do this. So this is actually a bona fide quantum algorithm. It does actually involve, um, you know, analyzing quantum computation um, to a greater extent than just using Grover's algorithm as a black box, right? Um, so here, we're just gonna assume that we literally, for, for the purposes of my presentation, we're just gonna assume that we literally have a dihedral group uh, in class, you know, in the sense of classical group theory, right? So that your group is cyclic. Um, now, this is actually a real example, I mean, situation, right? Like ideal class groups uh, are often cyclic. And so then you would literally get a dihedral group when you um, make that cyclic group dihedral. Um, so we're going to suppose that we have a hidden subgroup here in one of these dihedral groups, and we want to find the hidden subgroup, OK? Um, and so the starting point is uh, it's, the, it's the same as, um, you know, it's the same setup as in Shor's algorithm, right? Um, you're going to take a um, sort of, you're going to take your hiding function, and you're going to, um, you know, take, take uh, you know, this particular state right here. This is exactly what it would be. Uh, in Shor's algorithm, which is for abelian hidden subgroups, right? The only difference is that we have a dihedral hidden subgroup, but it's the same uh, sort of initial state, right? You you take a superposition of all the inputs and outputs of your hiding function. Uh, and then just as in Shor's algorithm, uh, you're going to measure the second register and discard the result, okay? Um, now, in this case, um, the result is a little bit, I want to say, less useful uh, than it, what it would be uh, in Shor's algorithm, because you're, you're hiding, the subgroup that you're hiding has only two elements. And so when you do this uh, trick as in Shor of measuring the second register and discarding the result, uh, you get a combination of two um, elements here. Uh, there's a small typo here. There should be a parentheses over there. All right. So you're actually going to get just, um, you know, two possible, um, you know, outcomes. Okay. Um, and you can generate uh, a lot of these, um, but you have no idea. Uh, which ones you got, right? You you have you have a bunch of these, um, and you actually do need to generate a bunch of these um, for the algorithm to work. Um, and then again, just as in Shor's algorithm, uh, you're going to apply the quantum Fourier transform uh, to the first coordinate. Um, it's a little bit more, um, you know, limited here uh, because you only have two things to work with, right? So when you do this quantum Fourier transform, 
you're going to get something that looks like this. And then you measure that first register, just a chores algorithm. You get a K. Your second register is, um, you know, a superposition of two things, and it's sort of phase shifted um, by some value that depends on K. The K was what you measured when you what what you have got when you measured the first register. Okay, so you can get a lot of these uh, sort of superimposed uh, qubits. Uh, for each of them, you know, like how much the phase shift is. Um, and that's pretty much all. Right? You can't control what that phase shift is, but you know what it is when you measure when you measured that first register. You got uh, sort of that phase shift. Okay. Um, and so now you're going to um, sort of it's so so the rest is a little bit of a, a thought exercise, right? Like, what would be a useful phase shift to have here? Um, in fact, a useful phase shift um, would be something like n over two, uh, where n is the size of your um, original uh, cyclic group, right? Because if you had that then what that means is that um, you know, the, whether or not this is actually a plus sign or a minus sign depends solely on the parity of gamma, which is the angle of rotation, the hidden angle that you're trying to find, right? So if, if gamma is even, then minus one to the gamma is plus one. If gamma is odd, then minus one to the gamma is minus one, right? And so in that case, uh, you, have an, you have a uh, sort of superposition of uh, sort of, I, yeah, in, in that case, you you have, um, you know, you you can you could figure out uh, you can take an or, orthogonal basis, uh, you know, the plus sign and the minus sign um, over here, and you can measure with respect to that orthogonal basis, and you figure out uh, sort of which uh, which gamma you have uh, in terms of odd or even. Right? So that gives you one bit of gamma, um, and then you know this is the then you go through the usual exercise, right? You have you have a way to figure out one bit of gamma. Um, what can you do? Well, you can do the standard thing that we do with, um, you know, reducing, uh, you know, discrete log to like hardcore predicates or something like that. And then you can figure out all the bits of gamma one by one. So that would be if you could control that phase shift, right? But you really can't, you don't know exactly what that um, you know, phase shift is going to be. Um, so what can you do? Well, so then Kuberberg's idea was that, um, well, you can add and subtract um, phase shifts, right? So if you do control not in the right way, right? So control not here, remember, is um, if the first bit is zero, then do nothing to the second bit. If the first bit is one, then do something to the second bit. The only thing you do is flip it, right? So if you do a control not here um, to a product of um, two of these um, phase shifted um, qubits, then you're going to get something that looks like um, that at the end. And then now you measure the second register. And when you do that, your first register is going to be either a plus sign or a minus sign, okay? uh, depending on what the outcome of that second register was. So you can add and subtract um, these phase shifted states, right? Um, or more precisely, I should say, you can add or subtract them. Um, you can do one or the other, but you can't control which one you do. Uh, I always found that kind of um, sort of funny that you could you can do an arithmetic operation but you can't control which arithmetic operation you did um, right so regardless you can add or subtract these um, at least you know which one happened right even if you can't control which one happens um, right so then you can set up a this ends up then being like a lattice problem right um, like just ignoring the fact that you can't control uh, whether you add or subtract if you could control whether you could add or subtract let's say you could just reliably add or something like that, right? Then what does that mean? Well, that means that you can, what you need to do is you need to like add up these states to get up to n over two, right? Um, and you can't, and you don't want to like do too many of these, right? You don't want to like do an exponential number of uh, additions. You want to do a very small number of additions of these random states to get exactly n over two. That looks like a lattice problem, right? That's exactly what it is. Right. Um, now here it's a it's like slightly more difficult because you can add or subtract, but you can't control which one. Um, but it's still roughly speaking a lattice problem, right? So um, if you, and then if you work out sort of what you need here, uh, it ends up being a you know, sub exponential uh, kind of computation. Um, but then um, you know to optimize this quantum. Um, algorithm, uh, you want to do something like, um, you know, um, you know, figuring out, um, you know, more efficient um, ways to do the lattice reduction and things like that. 
Uh, so that's what some people have done. Uh, I mentioned two papers here. Uh, this one by Pikert, um, this CSIVS paper, and then this uh, scale paper by, um, you know, Chavez Saab and um, I think five other authors. Um, and so this, uh, so these results uh, give us some um, guidelines as to uh, what security we should expect from CRS or CSIGHT um, at the, you know, against a, a quantum adversary. Um, we find that, um, you know, we, we need probably, um, you know, thousand plus bit parameter sets uh, in order to get, you know, level one, level two, or level three, um, this uh, security as defined, or as some people would say, as ill-defined, um, you know, in the, in the uh, in this um, post-quantum standardization process, okay? Um, and how these compare with, um, you know, psych or something like that, uh, I don't, I don't have them uh, right here, but roughly speaking, like level one on psych is um, like uh, 10 million cycles or something like that, uh, as opposed to 10 billion cycles. So it's, it's going to be a lot slower uh, to use Seaside uh, if we, if we accept these uh, security estimates. And so that's, but that's the, that's what we have right now, uh, as far as uh, quantum algorithms go. Um, you know, even this, I would say, is not, it's not like, um, you know, super fast, right? It's, it's sub-exponential time, um, but it's still limited by the fact that, you know, we, we can only get, uh, like, because we're, our hidden subgroup is so small, we can only get, like, combinations of two uh, sort of qubits uh, at a time, and that's, that's the thing that limits this from uh, becoming, like, as fast as, like, in the case of Shor's algorithm or something like that. Um, but again, if that's if that's what we have, then uh, that that's our starting point, and we'll go from there. Okay, so I'm finished. I think okay, five minutes early was what we're supposed to do for yeah, questions. Yeah. Maybe a little bit we more have, than that, but for when we have time for 